and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and today we have a very special saint to share with you, the Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, Saint Michael the Archangel. Lucifer, angel of light, God's number one angel, decided that he wanted to be like God. And one third of the angels followed him, and they were going to take over. But there was a little voice. A voice from a lowly archangel rose up with the battle cry, Mikael, who is like God? And St. Michael the archangel and the army of faithful angels defeated Lucifer and threw him and his army of rebellious angels down into the pit of hell. And the battle has gone on from that day until this. And Michael is up to the battle. Michael comes accompanying his mother, uh, his queen, our mother. Michael is there for us to defend us against the enemy because today, as well as at that time, people are saying that they are like God. And Michael is yelling from the top of the mountains, there is only one God. So Michael is asking you to come with us as we travel to Italy, France, and Mexico. In the year 490, a lord of Gargano was searching for one of his prized bulls. He spotted the bull in a cave, kneeling. The cave was high above the lord and inaccessible, so he shot an arrow at the bull, which changed its course in mid-flight and struck the lord. He went to the local bishop with his story, who immediately instituted three days of fasting and prayer at the site. During this time, the archangel Michael appeared to the bishop. He said to him, I am, I am Michael the archangel, and I'm always in the presence of the Lord. This cave is sacred to me. It is of my choosing. There will be no more shedding of bull's blood. Where the rocks open widely, the sins of man may be pardoned. That which is asked for here in prayer will be granted. So therefore go up to the mountain and dedicate the grotto to the angels and Christian worship. The bishop, not convinced by the apparition of the angel, did nothing. Two years went by. The nearby town of Saponto was being invaded by pagan soldiers. It looked like the town of Gargano was going to be defeated the bishop asked for a three-day truce for prayer. During that time, Michael appeared again to him and promised that if the people would attack the enemy in faith, he, Michael, would lead them to victory. They did as he commanded, and they were victorious. The bishop went up to the mountain, to the mouth of the cave, but again, he would not enter the grotto, nor would he have a church built there. Another year passed by. On the anniversary of the apparition, the bishop appealed to the pope for guidance. The pope ordered him to go up to the cave, this time with bishops of the regions, and for three days to pray and fast. During this time of prayer and fasting, Michael again appeared to the bishop. He ordered him into the grotto, and he said, It is not necessary that you dedicate this church, I myself have consecrated it with my presence. Enter, and with my help, raise prayer and celebrate the sacrifice of the Mass. I will show you how I myself have consecrated that place. The bishop finally obeyed. When he entered the cave, he found an altar covered with a red cloth and a crystal cross upon it as the angel had predicted. What a blessing to be here. What a special, special blessing to be here where the angel himself appeared and claimed the mountain for himself. And no amount of fallen angels, including the head fallen angel, has any power over Saint Michael and his heavenly army of angels. This cave, has become a basilica and has never been consecrated by a bishop. It has been consecrated by the presence of the angels. Many miracles have been attributed to the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel here. And for a minute, I would just like you to look, look at the image of Michael. 
one of the most important things about it is if you look at his face, he looks like a woman. Gentle. Very gentle, sensitive. If you look at his body, he's got the strength of a man. And just notice the way he subdues Satan with just his little pinky. The disdain that he has for him. We give Satan so much importance, Michael gives him none at all. Remember, this with Michael the archangel was not a big angel. He was not an important mm. angel. But it was Michael who said, who is like God? Mikael. And Michael and the loyal angels subdued Satan, Lucifer, and the evil angels and threw them into hell. When you enter the mouth of this cave, if you enter in a, with a sense of sorrow for your sins in a state of grace, all your sins are forgiven you. Why is that important? Because we need to know we are forgiven. You have a gift here that you can not only enter this cave, but bring your loved ones here. We're told bring your petitions to the foot of the altar. Bring your petitions to this cave. And we do. People have come on this pilgrimage in faith bringing their loved ones, bringing those who are sick in mind and body emotions. We're at a time when they tell us there are no angels, when they tell us there is no devil, consequently, is there a God? This is such a holy place that St. Francis of Assisi came and he prayed right at the mouth of the, of the cave. He prayed and fasted for 30 days and 30 nights and then felt unworthy to enter the cave. We come, we enter this cave unworthy because we know of God's mercy. God wants to forgive us and he only asks us to come here humbly believing. I come here and I ask Michael the Archangel to intercede for our world. This is a very special year because this is the centenary, the 1500th anniversary of the apparition of St. Michael the Archangel here at the Cave of Gargano. And we said that this is the only church that was not consecrated by a bishop. This is the only church other than that of the Nativity in Bethlehem that has never been consecrated by a bishop. This has been consecrated by the presence of the angel, whereas the church in Bethlehem was consecrated by the presence of Jesus. We point your attention to this chair. It's an Episcopal chair, the chair of the bishop. It dates back to the 14th century. And here to the left, this was a gift to the church, to the Basilica of St. Michael the Archangel by Pope John Paul II in 1987. And our beloved vicar said that what this symbolizes is that Michael the Archangel, leading all the other angels, again is claiming victory of the world for God. Who is like God? Michael the Archangel is telling us, and with the symbol of the doves, that peace will come to the earth through the intercession of the angels. I would like to also bring your attention very proudly to Michael. And Michael reigns, the least, one of the least of the angels, reigns as king of the angels because he said yes. When one angel fell because he wanted, out of pride, to be like God, another angel rose because he defended God. Again, the messages. So we are so blessed. We would just like to introduce Father, Father our Miguel. dear friend, Father Miguel, who has written, Miguel, who has written books about the cave and who has been kind enough to allow us to explain about the cave. Father Miguel is, uh, has told us that the Benedictines have been custodians of this sure. special blessed cave since the year 1970, and prior to that time, it was the priest of the diocese. Diocese. I'm speaking Italian. Si puoi dire qualche valore per piacere? You must remember that this sanctuary is one of the oldest in the church. Pilgrims would come here directly from the Holy Land on their way to Rome after having venerated the tomb of our Lord Jesus in the Holy Land. 
At one time, there were three major pilgrimage places in the world. One of them was Rome, Palestine, the Holy Land, and here, the cave of St. Michael on the Gargano. At this shrine, popes, kings, as well as many saints and princes came. It has always been considered a sanctuary of penance. Pilgrims came here to pray for the intercession of the archangel in order to make a proper act of penance for their sins, and they would receive the Eucharist after that. The saints came here and prayed to the angel for his intercession and help, always believing themselves to be the greatest sinners. The more one is a saint, the more he considers himself a sinner before the Lord. We don't look at our sins because we're very superficial. We think we're too good to have committed sins. The saints always felt they offended God, even in their smallest sins. Therefore, they had to seek help of the angels. When Padre Pio was alive, he sent penitents here to ask the help of Michael the Archangel before returning to confess to him. We too now ask him to help us maintain our peace with our dear Lord. Mont Saint Michel, the mountain of Saint Michael, is located on the far end of Normandy. On the same coast is Dunkirk where hundreds of thousands of American, British, and German lives were lost in World War II. Less than a hundred miles on the other side of Mont Saint-Michel is Lisieux, home and shrine of St. Therese the Little Flower. In the year 708, the whole area, which is now a bay, was a forest with two rocky peaks. One was and is still called Tombelaine. The other was known as Mont Tom, or as it is now called, Mont Saint-Michel. It began as a shrine to Belen, the Celtic god of light, and then later became a shrine to the Roman god Mercury. It did not become a Christian place of worship until the fifth century when it was occupied by hermits from the other side of the channel, Ireland. They set up two oratories under the protection of Saint Stephen and Saint Florian. The Archangel Michael appeared to Saint Aubert, who was then the Bishop of Avranche. Michael commanded that a sanctuary be built on Montombe in his honor. The sanctuary was built on the very mountain where the pagans had worshipped. However, this is not unusual in the history of our church. In Assisi, for example, there is a church called Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. St. Mary over the temple of Minerva. The church was built over the ruins of a pagan temple. When you visit this shrine, one of the great miracles that you become aware of is how they were able to build it in the first place. First, they had to fight the strong pagan influence that prevailed. Then, the physical difficulties seemed to be insurmountable. But when God is in charge, cannot a child with the angel's aid cause the monuments of a pagan cult to tremble? Saint Aubert sent representatives to Mont Sant'Angelo, the cave of Saint Michael in the Gargano in Italy, to retrieve a relic from that mountain. When the emissaries returned from the, with the precious stones from the holy cave, what did they find? Where there had formerly been a forest, waves were smacking on the shores of the sea-swept bay, the forest had become an island. Do you find that hard to believe? Well, how do you explain this? This is not only the tradition of the shrine, but geologists have affirmed that in the 8th century, a sudden encroachment of the sea did take place around the new Christian sanctuary that was there. Phenomenon? We would rather believe miracle. We believe in miracles. But for those who do not, no explanation is possible. 
The miracle of changing the forest into an island created its own set of problems when it came to constructing a building on the island. Many workers died bringing materials over to the island. They had to carry huge, heavy blocks across the sea to the mountain. Often when the material was so heavy, the carts and animals sunk in the marsh, but the Lord would have his way. With St. Michael and the angels in charge, the monument was completed. The laying of the foundations for the crypts, which would eventually support the massive church buildings on the island, was in itself a miracle. Remember, in those days, they couldn't blast into the mountain. They didn't have derricks to lift the heavy stones used to build the many churches and buildings. But Bill, they did. In 1154, the mountain became known for more than buildings made of stone and mortar. With the new abbot at Mont Saint-Michel, it became spiritual. With the new collection of manuscripts, which the abbot composed and transcribed himself, the mountain became known as the city of books. But often good works, even holy works, suffer the ruthless attacks of the fallen angels. In 1423, Abbot Robert Jolivet, one of those associated with Joan of Arc's trial, having been won over by the English, sought to capture the abbey. It was heroically defended and remained in the hands of the custodians. According to the accounts of that time, the archangel Michael raised a miraculous storm whose fury wrecked the majority of the English ships, dashing them against the rocks at the foot of the mount. Often people are so in awe of the phenomenon of Mont Saint-Michel, they miss the miracle. And in missing that miracle, they miss the great miracle, the archangel's message that he is present, fighting the enemies of God and his children. Like Jesus, he echoes across the bay. Be not afraid. Michael is always with us. In the year 1631, 100 years after Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego in Mexico City, a very special gift was given to Diego Lazaro in a little town called St. Barnaby in the province of Tlaxcala. Diego was one of the earliest converts to the faith. As was the custom of the day, he was married at the young age of 17. He and his bride lived a very modest lifestyle, much as his ancestors before him. On the feast of St. Mark on April the 25th, 1631, just one short year after his marriage, while processing with other members of his church, he had an apparition of St. Michael the Archangel. The angel said, Know, my son, that I am St. Michael the Archangel. I come to tell you that it is God's will in mind that you tell the neighbors of this village and its surroundings that in a ravine that is made up of two hills and is in front of this place can be found a spring of miraculous water for all infirmities. It is under a big boulder. Don't doubt what I tell you or put aside what I command you. We don't know if it was because Diego didn't think anyone would believe him, but he told no one. He did nothing. As scripture has warned, whenever someone has doubted the angel, the results have not been pretty. Remember Zechariah, the father of St. John the Baptist? And so it was with Diego. A few days after the angel had delivered his message, Diego fell gravely ill. Neither Diego nor his grieving family had any idea that his illness was attributed to his disobedience to the archangel. On May 8th, as Diego lay dying in his bed just 13 days after St. Michael had given him the message, a terrifying blast of light and sound, very much like a lightning bolt, came crashing through the small hut, sending even Diego's closest family scrambling for their lives. St. Michael had frightened everyone away so that he could have a conversation with Diego. When everybody returned, they were amazed not only to see that the grass hut had not burned to the ground, but that Diego could have survived the impact. Imagine the shock and surprise when they entered the hut only to see Diego sitting up in bed, fully recovered. He told them St. Michael had appeared to him and transported him to a ravine. St. Michael had told them the spot he was striking with his staff was where the fountain he had spoken of during the procession was located. He then told him to make it known or he would be greatly punished. 
As St. Michael touched the earth with his staff, rays of light shot down from heaven like a beacon on a lighthouse, pointing the way to this fountain, which, as the angels said, would be a spring for the health and healing of all infirmities. Now, well and walking around, Diego knew what he had to do. He traveled 20 kilometers to tell the governor of Tlaxcala that the archangel wished people to come to the spring, which no one could see. Needless to say, they ridiculed the simple Indian, and when that did not discourage him, they threatened him physically. I believe he was more frightened with what the angel would do than what mere man could do. And so with his family's encouragement, they all set out to find the spring. Now the spot in the ravine which the angel had pointed to was covered by a huge boulder. Diego and his wife, along with his parents, dug and dug, trying every which way to dislodge the huge rock to no avail. They couldn't budge it. They did not give up, but kept on digging, although I'm sure they thought the whole enterprise was hopeless. The rock was solidly embedded into the earth. Suddenly, as if out of nowhere, a strikingly handsome young man appeared. His kind face was radiant. He asked them if he could help. As they gladly stepped to the side, he lightly pushed the stone and it rolled away. He touched the spot the angel Michael had pointed to in the apparition and water immediately became, began to come freely. The four began to dig until they could see a shimmering spring of clear rippling water. Now you would think this would inspire Diego to shout from the mountaintops. But even after two apparitions of St. Michael, Diego lay back and did nothing. Six months passed. We find Diego at Mass. Suddenly, out of nowhere, he felt the most excruciating pain in his legs. It felt as if his bones had been dislocated. Barely able to move, he literally dragged himself along the road. His whole lower body felt crushed. When Diego felt as if death would take him at any moment, St. Michael appeared a third time. After chastising him even more severely than the first two times, he asked Diego if he had to punish him again, or would he do what he had ordered him to do? Again, Diego's mysterious ailment disappeared. Diego ran to the spring and filled some buckets with water and with great haste set out for Puebla of the Angels. He went straight to the bishop, and after he had recounted his story, the bishop promised to investigate the apparitions. So that he could authentically verify what Diego had said, the bishop insisted Diego give the water to members of his household. Everyone who drank from the water from this miraculous spring was healed completely. The church scrupulously investigated the apparitions and the spring beginning in 1632. After intense investigation, the apparition was declared authentic and given approval. In 1643, another investigation was called. In 1644, it was completed. Again, it was confirmed. Finally, in 1675, having been investigated for the last and final time, Holy Mother the Church declared that all three visions were in truth from God. Diego spent his last three years on earth serving St. Michael and his miraculous spring, now a well. By his selfless tending of the sick and infirmed who came to the well, he was the true miracle of St. Michael. He had obeyed. Maybe it was a bit late, like St. Augustine's late, have I loved you. But the Lord, through his generous love and patience, can work even with a reluctant giver. According to tradition, the townspeople said that on the day Diego died, they saw brilliant rays of sunshine flooding the town. When his body was exhumed many years later, it was found to be incorrupt. There are so many miracles that have occurred, the custodian tells us it's no longer possible to chronicle them. The water stopped flowing for some unexplainable reason, and then it began to flow again seven years ago. Father Gilberto Cervantes, the custodian, told us, when the people do penance, the well water returns. When they fail to do so, it dries up. Father said that if the water were used for anything but a holy intention, the well would dry up again. On Saturday, July the 28th of the year 1990, the well began to flow once more. We want to share with you our own personal miracle that happened to Penny at the Grotto of St. Michael in Mexico. When we left for Mexico for this pilgrimage to Our Lady of Guadalupe, Penny was not supposed to go. She really was supposed to be in the hospital. She had hurt her back during work at the studio the week before, 
and the doctor had said she couldn't go. Well, but knowing Penny the way we do, we knew she was going to go, but he pleaded with her to stay in the wheelchair and not to go out of the city, just to go to the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray there, sit in the wheelchair, and then come home. Well, <laughs> I really believe that Our Lady and Michael had a different uh, plan in mind, and so I was on the bus. I hadn't slept for nights. It was just the most excruciating pain I ever had. And when we got to the shrine, I just couldn't even use the wheelchair because the road was so bumpy. So I struggled between two pilgrims and got to the grotto. When you entered the grotto, there was such a feeling of the angels, the presence of the angels, mm. that Father Jay, who was with us, started to sing. And all the 92 uh, pilgrims joined in holy ground, that we were being surrounded by all the angels. I found myself kneeling. And, and then I came in. <laughs> I didn't see her kneeling at first because it's a small chapel and there were 92 people in there, but when I had everybody go out to go and get water from the well, I saw my wife kneeling. She was not supposed to be kneeling. I said, honey, you've got to get up. You can't kneel. And as I went to help her up, she got up on her own. And then she proceeded to walk up 15 stairs to the back of the altar, on top of the altar, to touch the cape of the statue of St. Michael. I just felt like the woman in Holy Scripture. If I could just touch his cape, then I would know that God had heard my petitions. I had not prayed for a healing. I had prayed for something far more important. And after I touched the cape, I, I found myself coming down the steps. I couldn't even walk without shuffling, no less climb and go up and down steps. She started down the stairs. She walked over to the bus. She did a little bit of a dance. <laughs> and all the pilgrims were raving. They were so proud and pleased. And we all praised our Lord Jesus for the beautiful gift he gave her. Actually, what happened is with, then we got back to the hotel. And Penny had to go from one bus to the other to give a message. And she ran over from the one bus to the other. So the pilgrims were able to see the miracle she had been given. You know. All we hear is bad news, now within the church and without the church. Well, the good news is that the angels are with us. Michael is shouting, who is like God? Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.